All right. Um, well, while we wait for him to come up, maybe we can start with some introductions. Um, do you sure. want to kick it off? Yeah, I'll get things started here for everybody. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for showing up. Um, I was brought into this impromptu, but I'm sure some of you who have been to Everclear, formerly Connext uh, Spaces before, have heard my voice. Uh, my name's Garg. I'm here to host, and what that means in this case is gently guide things along uh, and just allow the people who know what they're talking about to talk about those things that they know. Um, this is the Everclear with Arbitrum, Gelato, Eigen, if Eigen arrives, uh, Hyperlane, and the Graph to talk about, well, <laughs> everything that's going on here. Uh, in particular, Everclear and the Clearing House. Uh, and clearing layer uh, agenda that uh, is the hot new thing. Um, I'll kick it off here by booting things over to Arjun uh, and allowing him to talk a little bit about the Everclear rebrand and what exactly the clearing layer is. Yeah, awesome. Looks like we have your arm here as well now. So yeah, I guess before before jumping into that, let's do a quick round of intros. Um, sure. I'm I'm Arjun. I'm one of the founders of Connext, or I guess now Everclear. Oh my God, it's going to take me a while too. Um, uh, Everclear is uh, the first clearing layer. Um, this is a, it's a it's a totally new concept that we have uh, a new primitive that we have pushed forward um, that that helps to solve this very critical problem of, of fragmentation within the modular ecosystem. Um, over the course of this talk, I'll be I'll be talking a little bit more about like the Everclear thesis, so I won't jump too deeply into it right now. Um, instead, I'll just hand it over to uh, John from Hyperlane. Go ahead, John. Thank you. Thank you. That's so kind. Uh, pretty stoked to uh, be here. And I'll say I'm bound to use Connects a few times. Uh, uh, you know, Everclear is growing on me, but uh, it's been too long of being used to Connect, so it takes a little. We went the same thing a few years ago. Uh, I'm John. I co-founded Hyperlane, you know, going on. Uh, you know, I feel like an old man I'm about to turn 34 and going on year seven in crypto. And, uh, what we're building here with Hyperlane, which has been a part of uh, enabling Everclear, is an open framework for interoperability that anyone can use to connect any chain and kind of do it on their terms. Perfect. Thanks, John. So we'll hand that over then uh, to Sriram from uh, Eigenlayer. Hi, everybody. Uh, so we're excited to be here. Um, uh, I'm Sriram. I started the Eigenlayer pro project three years back. Um, Eigenlayer is a mechanism for supplying uh, crypto economic security to general protocols. Super excited to learn uh, about the new uh, developments and building a uniform clearinghouse for the crypto space. Uh, I've known Arjun for many years now and uh, really excited to see this new wave of innovation here. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, Tegan uh, from Edge of Node slash The Graph. Thank you so much. It's great to be here to celebrate Everclear. Uh, I'm Tegan Klein. I'm the CEO of Edge and Node. Uh, we're the initial team behind the graph, and we're passionate about a decentralized internet, and where the graph fits in the stack is at the decentralized data layer. So a lot of people like to say what Google does for the web in organizing the world's data so that we can easily access it. The graph does that for Web3, so developers and users of applications on the web can access data that is served by many different indexers so that no one company has control of that data or information. So it's all about data integrity on the web. And lastly, but definitely not least, uh, Lewis from uh, Gelato. Hey, hey, uh, nice to see you all again. Indeed, actually, I think I know all of the speakers here as well for many years. So great to come together with you guys here on this Twitter space. We haven't been on one in, uh, one of these in ages, to be honest. So yeah, it's nice to be back. Yeah, so uh, Gelato, I think a lot of people uh, know Gelato from like four years ago when we were the first smart contract automation protocol. And since then have been doing things and uh, relaying. That's actually how we really got started working with the, with the Connex guys back when they were actually Connex. Uh, and now Everclear and, and yeah, so we also have serverless uh, Web3 function environments that are used by pretty much every project and DeFi, NFTs and so on across many different chains. And then exactly like a year ago, we also launched our rollup as a service offering, which nowadays is a bit of our, our flagship product that you could say, because you can 
now basically get, gets 10x the benefits from our middleware services in like gas abstraction and so on by also just creating your own block space uh, and having a say uh, over how expensive that block space shall be by using novel solutions like EigenDA, for example, you can get these costs down and so on. So yeah, that's uh, what I'm excited about. I think Everclear is really cool. I, I re actually recorded a podcast uh, yesterday with Arjun on my sort of uh, hobby podcast on Gelato. Uh, so maybe I front ran you there, Tegan, on your, re on your real thing. But, but yeah, uh, it was definitely a great conversation. So I, I recommend everybody here to listen to these podcasts as they come out as well. Uh, it's really good, quite a cool idea. If you know a bit about bridging and interrupt and crypto, if you know a bit about across and whatnot, what these guys are doing, Everclear really might be, a, a, you know, the next step in that evolution for capital efficiency and, and lowering barriers to entry. Uh, so yeah, excited for the space. Perfect. So circling back, um, I'll kick it over to Arjun again, just to, I guess, start things off and talk again a little bit about Everclear, the rebrand. Um, what happened to Connects, what's going forward with Everclear and what the clearing layer is. Super excited to have Everclear out in the open now. Um, it's been something that we've been thinking about for a very long time. The Everclear, formerly Connects, has been in this space for a really long time. We we first started the project back in 2017, uh, where we were one of the first like teams working on figuring out how can we make Ethereum and now I guess the Ethereum interchain usable to just the average person. Um, and pretty quickly that led us to like L2 scalability research, which of course then led us to interoperability because they're kind of two sides of the same coin. Um, and we realized there's this, there's this critical blocker uh, associated with, with how we can create an experience where users just really are able to use applications, right? And like, I think everybody that's up here is probably very aligned with this idea of like, we are building all of this infrastructure because we want to get to the point where it can become really, really easy for the next generation of products to come and like, and applications to be built on top of blockchains. Over the course of the last three years, um, Connext uh, had been had been working on trying to figure out this, this fragmentation problem. Um, how do we get to a point where users can go and use any application on any chain um, and without ever really knowing or needing to know what chain they're on in the first place? And every single time we tried to find a solution to this problem, we came to the same kind of core challenge, which is just that Basically, every single other project was also trying to find a solution to this problem, right? And everyone, everyone that's trying to find a solution to this problem is coming up with their own unique design, with their own liquidity pools, uh, with their own like agents, solvers, market makers, whatever, um, to try to find a solution. And uh, and all of all that this has done is basically worsen fragmentation. Um, it's honestly kind of interesting how this this space has played out. But when we started looking into like uh, you know di digging a bit deeper into like well. How could you make this better, right? How can how can we make it so that like any any bridge that spins up is able to support any chain? Um, how can we make it so that like every application, like if you want to use an app with some long tail token, you can still send that across chains with really good pricing, and, and you you can you know you can use the app without ever having to like think about bridging. Um, and what we realized was that at the crux of all of this was a single problem, which is that there's no shared communication layer for people in the, or for like entities in the space. So uh, by this, I mean like actors, like uh, uh, like solvers, like LPs, like market makers, people who are facilitating transactions that are going across chains. There's no communication or coordination layer for them to work with each other to figure out how to better do that. Um, now in traditional finance, we have this concept of clearing. Clearing is uh, is basically represents everything that happens between when like a transaction is is executed um, and then when it gets settled. So, for example, if you go and you pay with a credit card to to buy a to buy a coffee today, clearing like Visa is basically the the entity that like clears your transaction. And what happens is you 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 pay for your coffee with your card. Visa authorizes the transaction. So basically, your transaction is executed and you get your coffee and you get the the experience that you want. And behind the scenes, Visa is the one that goes and figures out. Okay, how do I take this IOU that has been generated and turn it into a net movement of funds between banks? And in the process of doing that, there's a lot of optimization that happens. Visa basically takes all of these transactions and aggregates them down, nets them off. And I think netting is a is a bit of a challenging concept to get verbally, but if you go to like the the original Everclear announcement thread, you'll see this like image that describes netting. And usually when you look at the image, it, it makes a lot more sense. Um, netting basically means taking a bunch of transactions that are going in opposite directions that are likely like canceling each other out um, and reducing them down to just a finalized flow of funds. 
And so Visa basically takes all of these transactions, potentially billions of dollars of, of volume, and turns that into sometimes millions of dollars of settlement. This optimization is part of what allows financial systems to run the way that they do outside of crypto. And I think what we've kind of realized from our side is like, the more we've dug into this problem, the more we've come to this, this conclusion on our side, which is crypto needs this too. And the, the key kind of insight that, that led us to this point where we were like, okay, this is actually, this is the time. Now is the time at which a clearing, some, something, a system that is not necessarily a clearinghouse because clearinghouses are very like custodial and central, but a system that performs a similar role that allows for different market actors to like coordinate with each other to clear transactions. The, 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 the key insight that kind of led us to believe this is the time is that we found out that 80% of the volume that is flowing between chains today is actually nettable. That basically means like out of every dollar that you send into Arbitrum, 80 cents flows out in a, in a day. That's kind of crazy, um, right? It basically means that people are bridging about five times more than they need to. Um, this is the Everclear vision. Um, we believe that there is, that if we are able to coordinate all of the backend liquidity providers, folks like market makers, folks like sexes, folks like intent solvers, we're able to coordinate them with each other. We can so dramatically reduce the cost of like moving liquidity between chains that we can allow for bridging to become completely seamless, right? We can allow protocols like across, like Uniswap, like Socket, to be able to expand to every single chain in this ecosystem. And, and I think that this really, really dovetails very well into the like the theses behind why a lot of the other projects that are up here exist. Right. So for Hyperlane, for instance, giving permissionless access to every single chain is such an important primitive for this whole ecosystem to work. But it's it's most important when you can also give permissionless liquidity. Um, for, for the graph, being able to read the data of every single new ecosystem pops up is extremely valuable, but but only works if like those ecosystems are able to like connect to bridges on day one. Um, this is kind of, we, we've sort of seen this as like the culmination of both our research and then also a bunch of the other incredible innovation that's happening in the space. And so I think that a big part of the goal of this space specific, specifically is also, also to, <clears throat> sorry, I didn't breathe enough in that <laughs> second. Uh, a big part of the space is, uh, a big part of the goal of this space is also to highlight um, the, the fact that Everclear is built on top of these really, really powerful primitives, right? Like, Everclear exists because, and specifically only because, we have technology like Arbitrum Orbit rollups. You have technology like Gelato's rafts and like all of the other supplementary infrastructure they build. We have, you know, permissionless access to data through the graph. We have permissionless interoperability through Hyperlane, and we have permissionless security through Eigenlayer. I want to give an example because this helped to crystallize it for me. So an example is like Sriram owes Lewis ten dollars. Lewis owes Arjun $10 and Arjun owes Sriram $10. And so that's super inefficient, right? Because everyone's doing these different transactions. And then if you owe it on different chains, it becomes a big mess. So with what they're doing with Everclear, no one owes anyone anything, right? You don't have to do any transactions. So it makes it much more efficient. But this clearing layer, as someone who comes from traditional finance, it needs to be decentralized so that there's not a monopoly there, so that you know there can't be censorship there and to fight for freedom on the web. So I'm really excited about what Everclear is doing because of this. Yeah, thanks for the example there. That was really helpful. Analogy that I uh, tend to use, Arjun, as you know, is like uh, Everclear is the split wise for, for um, bridging, I guess, uh, that I suppose some people have used split wise here, unless you already made it very big in crypto. Yeah, that's a great one. Um, it is it is really, really similar to Splitwise, right? Everybody just records their IOUs on this single system, and then the system figures out, okay, how much does everyone actually owe each other at the end of the day? Um, yeah, great analogy. And I'll, I'll actually also link the, or maybe the Everclear account should do this, but um, we should, we'll, we'll also like link that image um, uh, below this tweet thread um, so that it's, it's also available if people want to take a look. All right. So now that we kind of have a good idea of what the clearing layer is and whatever clears mission is going forward, um, let's uh, kind of round table with each of the guests here and just talk about what kind of role does each of your projects play uh, with Everclear? I'll kind of like put that out to the group. In the simplest terms, what Hyperlane uh, does for Everclear in this realm of it basically becoming the real on-chain clearinghouse for crypto is Hyperline becomes the 
connective pipes or the plumbing in between the different chains that Everclear will be serving. And you know that that's the the most simplistic version of it. Uh, you know we can be more specific and say that effectively it is the transport layer that Everclear is using to enable this clearing to enable this netting so that again we don't have to go through seven transactions uh, as in Tegan, I think Tegan's example was uh, probably like the best layman's term explanation of like how clearing works that I've heard in, in years to be honest um, and so if you're if you want something to be netted out between Arbitrum Base and uh, let's say Blast, Hyperlane is just basically being used as those pipes, as the transport layer. And because of the, the nature of Hyperlane, and it's kind of permissionless, uh, open, open form, it allows Everclear to directed its, its expansion to new chains on its own terms. Uh, they are never dependent on someone else for expansion to new chains. If there's a place they want to go to, they'll be able to. And I think, uh, you know, certainly Arjun and the team will know best, but uh, I'd like to think that was a big motivating factor in the choice to use Hyperlink. I guess I can go next and also quick, uh quick shout out to Hyperlane because I think you guys were one of the earliest I know at least that really saw this world of many roll apps and app chains and so on coming. I think there was a bit of trivia initially, John, and, and I think maybe the name, you, you mentioned you had a name change and if I'm correct, you were optics at some point, but maybe I'm completely wrong here, but that's. Yeah, the core, like what, you know, the origin story for what is today Hyperlane definitely involved the uh, optics protocol. And so it, that is like the foundational thing that uh, the design was based on. And, you know, a lot's changed in the three years since, but yeah, it's a uh, name changes right. are, you know, can be good and fun, but uh, they're kind of hectic as they happen. But anyways, that's all distract. Uh, I think what uh, Gelato is doing. Piece, is piece, of, piece of trivia. More interesting. <laughs> piece of trivia here. I, I expect some prize money later, John. But anyways, um, <laughs> let's split was it. But anyways, uh, yeah. So so I think um, it's so, as a roll-up, as a service provider, it's so obvious that Everclear is just so necessary because we work with many um, bridging providers. Like, I mean, these words are very, they're very blurred lines and so on. It's very hard to, you know, uh, understand what, what is like a messaging protocol and interop protocol. What is a bridge? What is a cross? What is this? What is that? But ultimately, um, I think one of the best models um, for bridging um, and the dominant one now on many chains is this sort of a solver model, this intense based model where someone fills your orders from their own liquidity. And the reason that is a really good one is uh, that is, it, it can use the canonical token representations often of the roll-up bridge, for example. So it, ultimately it optimizes for security. It optimizes for what the roll-up affords you. And of course you also have a mint and burn model, which I think also has its um, right of existence. And it, it is, that model is, is really the, you know, the, I guess the, the dream of any uh, cross-chain messaging protocol, because then the cross-chain me messaging protocol itself can just freely mint and burn assets, and and you don't really have any problem with um, inventory and whatnot. But you have the issue that now you don't really use the roll-up bridge anymore, and you trade off a lot of a lot um, you know a lot of security there, and ultimately you don't really retain many of the benefits of the assets uh, layer like Ethereum that issues these assets and secures them. Uh, and, and instead, you now have this intermediary layer, like a you know, um, I, I guess like a hyperlane can also be used for that a layer zero, a CCIP or whatever it is. So, um, so yeah, um, and and so let, let's focus for, not on the mint and burn model. It's a bit of a different one, but let's focus on this this uh, you know um, liquidity provision model. I mean, right now I think across is, is dominating there, and uh, and there it's just like talking to them, but also to others like layer zero, Stargate, whatnot, like uh, Connect. Everybody that is engaging in this market making is, is they are operating in their own silo on their own books and they very quickly run dry um, and they very quickly have to resort to very capital inefficient, um, uh, you know, things like injecting fresh capital to fill orders all the time. 
And that's, of course, not great. Uh, it means that it's very capital intensive. It means that you cannot make markets for many tokens. It means that you cannot make markets on many chains because to actually rebalance that inventory to have the money where you need it to be, to be able to fill orders every day, you now nowadays often need seven days uh, via the optimistic uh, withdrawal period, right? And and that is just is, is just horrible. Now, of course, um, um, zero knowledge rollups and so on can bring this down quite a lot. But ultimately, in a world of you know thousands or, or hundreds of thousands of chains that we at Gelato believe in, that model very quickly becomes unscalable again. And and something like Everclear is just um, a way to make that model more feasible in this world of many rollups and and to bring down the cost of uh, you know the, the barrier to entry really uh, by uh, reducing the need to rebalance by by um, you know essentially by coordinating I'm sure Sri Ram will love this world by coordinating amongst market makers amongst solvers uh, and this is it's such a great system and um, again like this has already been invented by Visa and the likes right by Bank of America back in the day um, it's, it, I love this so much because it's like competitors come together and they coordinate for their own good, but they still incentivize to coordinate in the system, right? Like this is one of the examples where Moloch is actually slain, right? To quote from Arjun's past here, because here in, in the system in Everclear, technically we can have these solvers that are now competing with each other come together for 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 their own good and have everyone benefit from it. Um, and yeah, that's great. Uh, and that's essentially just like Arjun mentioned earlier by reducing the need to rebalance so often uh, by by essentially you know um, making it so that you don't have to have these huge pockets of capital on all these chains to be able to fill any trade uh, between these chains at any given amount of time you you can now use other people's capital that is deployed there and you can match inflows with outflows from other from your competitors essentially uh, and for for your own good and for their good so so that that's great and i think that's just simply necessary to to scale uh from like two three rollups to you know 10 20 or whatever more rollups that are all you know in the pipelines as we know yeah really exciting to see the the thinking that has led to this uh, idea of a crypto clearinghouse um you know Arjun and Connext have put in a lot of thought on how the modular ecosystem will evolve and particularly even inside bridging, what modules will get created and you know each can therefore super specialize on one really critical functionality. And uh, the goal of Everclear is to uh, solve this coordination problem for uh, being uh, a place where all the uh, all the different flows can be netted out. So I, I think this is super exciting. The way our project Eigenlayer and EigenDA kind of fit into the to the Everclear protocol is uh, Everclear itself. You need a place where all these uh, claims are stated so that you can net them out, and that's run as an uh, orbit rollup, and so. When you're running a rollup, uh, you know one of the things is: do you want to use Ethereum DA or you want to use, you know, something like Eigen DA? So that's one place where um, Eigen Layer and Eigen DA interact with the Everclear protocol. The other place is the uh, this protocol. It's th this rollup itself and other rollups will take time to settle back to Ethereum before any of these claims are made solid and using hyperlane and in particular a mode where you know at least inside the ethereum l2s you can actually use eigenlayer and restaking to get economic security to pass these claims around instantaneously with um, with a certain guarantee that if these claims are wrong you would be able to slash and uh, slash a certain stated amount of funds uh, ensures that these claims can now be passed along really efficiently. So I think uh, those are the two places where we see synergies with the Everclear protocol and excited to see this being built. Yeah, just to, to jump in here, like I want to highlight Eigenlayer in particular because there is, it is, there, it, it can be kind of hard for, for folks to, to visualize or conceptualize what exactly, like where exactly Eigenlayer gets used uh, because it is used under the hood and it's, effective, then you should never know that it exists. Um, for us specifically, we we kind of noticed that, like a couple of things. Like um, 
the first is that what we're trying to do is coordinate a bunch of market actors that are like currently competitive, right? Uh, you know, I, it's do do like random solvers that have never talked to each other and that are in hyper competition with one another trust each other? Absolutely not. Um, do they trust the systems that they're working with? In most cases, no, unless you can provide like crypto economic guarantees, right? Um, like a lot of solvers are folks who have been operating in the MEV ecosystem. And so they understand that there's like, you know, there's like even tiny marginal differences in how transactions are ordered can result in like massive changes in their, in their like revenue um, and in their profitability. And so the system, like if Everclear is to work, it has to work in a way where one, it, it is truly neutral, right? Like everybody that is using it can see the way that it's supposed to operate, can verify the way that it's supposed to operate and can verify that like everything that comes out of it is correct. Um, and, uh, and two, there needs to be some like attributable number, some economic security that you can attribute to this to say, no, we know this is both, this is like secure and verifiable. Eigenlayer gives that. Um, I don't really, <laughs> I don't subscribe to the economic security as a meme notion. Um, I truly think that like there is a value to having like tangible economic security and, and like a number to tangible economic security. Um, because, you know, in this case, we can explicitly say something like, okay, well, you know, uh, the Everclear rollup is currently clearing like within this like 30 minute period or within this one hour period is currently clearing like $150 million of value. And then like that is being secured by, by like $3 billion in eigenlayer restake security. And so you can say objectively, this is secure in this moment, right? Um, now, of course, there's a lot that like we need to work on there. There's a lot of research that needs to happen throughout this ecosystem to improve this process and to get to that kind of like guarantees. But that's the direction that we want to head is to be able to say, okay, we can use Hyperlane to communicate with any chain. And we know that communication is going to be backed by this like very credible on-chain commitment that has a certain amount of funds like attributed to it. Uh, just to add on one quick thing here to Origin's point, um, whether economic security is a meme or not for an L1 is a separate and deeper conversation than whether it is actually directly useful for things like bridges, where you can actually have a very clear crypto economic equation, the one that Arjun just pointed out, that as long as the total value of money that is being transmitted within the fraud proof period is less than the total amount of economic stake that is uniquely promised for the correctness of that service, you can actually be sure that you are, um, your system is crypto economically secure. And you know, there can be more advanced notions of the security where you're not just, it's not just stakers uh, staking and making a promise that they're doing it correctly. And if, the, if they do it wrong, their funds will be burned, which is what slashing is today. But you could also have redistribution, where if the stakers made a claim and the claim turned out to be wrong, there is a slashing process from which the funds are actually slashed. And instead of being burnt, they are actually redistributed back to the harmed parties, the ones who were involved in the clearing process. So this is one of the tightest systems of uh, security possible in, in a scenario like this. Absolutely. I mean, I think like this, and this only gets more and more important as the system scales to more chains. And like, you know, our goal is for Everclear to become the the core public goods coordination platform that everybody in this space uses for for move, for like managing liquidity operations, right? Um, and you know, if you subscribe to this notion that like there's going to be thousands of chains so that we're eventually going to migrate all of TradFi onto blockchains, then that's a really really important. And it's an extraordinarily critical piece of infrastructure for the future of the internet and like the future of finance. And that piece of infrastructure needs to have, you know, very, very credible security. It needs to have very like, it needs to have both like credible security and credible permissionlessness where we can say, okay, it's going to work everywhere and it's going to work the same way everywhere. Totally. Just to come in here for a second, it's also the, I think this whole economic security is a meme, like, well, it's as much as a meme as like knowing that there's legal recourse for committing certain crimes and like, hey, that the maximum sentence for uh, robbing a bank is, let's say, X years in prison. Well, especially in like this application of economic security, there can be very well-defined rules that says, hey, here's the offense. If you do this thing, if you're the, the operator that signs off on this, 
you are going to get slashed uh, for XML. Like the the whole economic security is a meme thing. I think is just a ridiculous uh, talking point. Like maybe relying on a certain amount, you know, maybe. $30 billion of economic security being useful for transactions at $100 million. Maybe that uh, premium there is a meme, but the fact that someone will know exactly the cost to commit fraud, the cost to commit a crime, in what world is that a meme, right? Like that is probably one of the best deterrents from this type of behavior. And the way that uh, Everclear will be using economic security, the way that a lot of people actually will be leveraging economic security from Eigenlayer is going to be pretty well defined rules and like I just I don't see the meme point and I think it, it makes for like great engagement and sometimes people get bored and, and wanted to you know pursue that line of reasoning but like once you dig into it it's like well what's the meme if a validator or an operator knows like if I uh, if I commit this offense if I sign this thing that shouldn't be signed if I uh, violate like the terms of my engagement i'm gonna get slashed i'm gonna lose money um so i think we should be feeling pretty good about using economic security for specific applications like here yeah not to go on a tangent here but if we go back to the social layer when there's a problem but it's inefficient and expensive and also political we just end up rebuilding tradfi and we're committed to building a decentralized internet, not rebuilding TradFi. And I think if we're all intellectually honest here, you know, is it as secure as we want it to be? No. Is it as decentralized as we want it to be? No. Is it as censorship resistant as we want it to be? No. But we're all here working on it and we're committed to that vision, or at least I know I am. You'll see this sort of with the Everclear design. And I really hope that a lot of other projects in the future also start thinking about this. Um, like if you're if you're rolling a new roll up and if you're doing something really genuinely interesting with it, I would I would urge you to consider this. Consider each project or each module that you work with is solving a specific problem, right? Like and and this is and if you're building a project in the space, try to solve a specific problem instead of trying to solve several. Um, for us, working with all the partners that are up here, like each partner is solving one problem for Everclear, right? Like Hyperlane is solving the ability for Everclear to touch every single chain. Um, the graph is solving the ability for every Everclear, like Everclear agents, and for the system to read data from every chain. Um, you know, Eigenlayer is helping solve economic security for the system. Uh, Gelato is solving uh, the orchestration of putting all of these pieces together and operating the system. And Orbit provides the actual underlying compute framework. Um, so, like, I, I I think like the pieces. So, you know, we've we've kind of historically talked a lot about composability and. I remember back in like 2020 era DeFi, you know, composability was like the number one thing that people talked about in the space is like, this is what gives DeFi an, ed an edge over, over TradFi. And we've lost that somewhat, right? We've lost that as this whole space is modularized. But the benefit of modularity is that you still do have composability. It's just, it's just further down in the stack, right? You can, you can go and take all of these individual infrastructure pieces, put them together to actually build things that are genuinely very new. And like, you get this because these pieces do interop extremely, interoperate extremely well. So yeah, just as, as a kind of like big shout out to everybody here, like the, the fact that you can put these pieces together in this way is why systems like Everclear can exist. And it is why we can move past the like, eventually move past the like picks and shovel stage of crypto and move towards building really new and really exciting things. Arjun, to riff on that, um, we earlier had some analogies to TradFi, clearing houses, right? Like Visa, the New York Stock Exchange um, split wise. Uh, but yeah, obviously Everclear brings the, the same benefits to, to cross-chain bridging, uh, but it, it is still very different at, at, at its core, right? It, it, it does not, you know, at its core em embrace the same level of centralization or custodianship uh, or trust even. So, so yeah, can you maybe explain a bit more how you are using all of these technologies to actually bring a version of a normally very centralized operation to crypto without, uh, you know, everyone that takes part um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, compromising their, their own decentralization or, or non-custodial guarantees. Absolutely. So clearing is something that's been, like I said, it's been around for a very long time. Um, the you know, people stood like the, the New York Stock Exchange, for example, adopted um, a clearinghouse back in like the 1920s. 
Um, and I think there have been other clearing houses that have been operating since the 1800s. Um, clearing is some like historically, right? People have found that there it doesn't like clearing is this like very very custodial, very centralized activity. Um, and usually clearing houses are run by like governments or at least entities that are like working ex extremely closely with governments and regulators. Um, the reason for this is that like clear clearing houses specifically, right? And this is this is the reason why we're like Everclear is not a clearing house. Um, it's a clearing layer because it's a it's an entirely different thing. But clearing houses, what they're doing is basically taking they're taking like custody over everyone's inventory. And historically, back when clearing houses were first created, what they were doing was like actually delivering the final assets. So like for example, for stock trading, like the clearinghouse was delivering stock certificates at the end of the day, right? It, it allowed you to be able to trade stocks without having to deal with the underlying like certificates and have, have to like actually send those around. But at, the, at some point, the clearinghouse was the one that actually did the settlement and drove a bunch of certificates to you um, or drove a bunch of gold to you or drove a bunch of whatever to you. Um, and, uh, and that is, you know, I think that's something that has really radically changed, um, obviously, as like we move towards this digital paradigm. Um, however, the majority of clearinghouses today are still still kind of operate in the same way, right? Like the New York Stock Exchange is still a very like centrally operated custodial entity. There has been a lot of work on decentralized clearing. Um, that's also not a new concept. Um, people, I think there's like been st strategies to attempt to do decentralized or peer-to-peer -peer clearing for uh, a few decades now, but they've historically not really done very well. And the reason for that is that like clearing on a purely peer-to-peer -peer basis, right? Where like I'm mapping out all of the financial relationships between like me and like Tegan and and Luis and Sriram and then all of their financial relationships and so on and so forth. Like that process is just extraordinarily complex. Um, and so this this notion of like, okay, you do still want some central computer, right? Some central system that is going and registering all of these interactions. And then is the thing that is doing the final computation of where funds should go. You still like having that notion is still important and it's efficient and it, it, there isn't, at least at today, there really isn't a way to do clearing without it. Um, the great thing about where we are today, specifically with blockchains, and I think I think you could have built this in the past as well, but it would have been just a bit harder and more expensive. Um, but the, the great great thing about where we are today with blockchains is that you can you can kind of get the best of both worlds. So you can build, you know, what are effectively like verified computers, verifiable computers, right? Like rollups that are literally verifiable servers. Right? You can build these verifiable servers. Over time, you can decentralize them using, you know, shared sequencing things, or uh, decentralized sequencing, and then you can have that. Uh, verifiable computer itself verifiably plug into all of these other chains. That's kind of how Everclear works specifically and what it's doing under the hood is it's not, it's not, it's like, it's still a, it's a totally non-custodial system. It's a totally like trust minimized system. Um, what it's doing is registering the state of everybody's like interactions with each other on other chains. Um, so for example, if you're like, say you are a market maker, um, and you want to go and like rebalance a certain amount of your capital between chains, you would go and put those funds into Everclear and sort of register your desire to do something um, and register, for example, okay, like I don't really care how long this transaction takes. It can happen over the course of the next six hours. I just want it to happen at the best possible price. Um, and I want it to be netted off again. I want that to happen because it's getting netted off against a bunch of other people's transactions. Um, you, can, you can go and register that with Everclear and Everclear, this, the, the kind of core chain, what it's doing is basically reading this on every chain it's connected to, um, and then ingesting that data and co computing what the outputted funds should look like. So coming up with a strategy for how to turn all of these like relationships, financial relationships that everybody has, all of these desired outcomes that everybody has, basically takes all of that information and computes what the out final outputted balances for everybody should be, and at what price. I would be curious how Hyperladen, um, again, comes into play as well, exactly, because obviously it's an important component here too. Yeah, um, I mean, basically, the, the I guess, like walking through a life cycle, right? Um, uh, if we talk about the example I gave earlier, where there's just like a, and this is a very simplified example, there's a lot more like, like the 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 majority of the user flows will likely be things like intent solvers that are that are interacting with Everclear as part of solving an intent. Um, but I don't want to jump too deeply into that because I think in order to understand that you have to have some diagrams. Um, so let's talk about the simple case of like, I'm a market maker and I want to move a million dollars between chains. Really hard to do that today with bridges. I want to, I want that to be moved in three to six hours, but so it's, you know, you can't use canonical bridges. You can't like, depending on which, which chain you're using, it, it's probably not worth it. 
uh, because there might be like a seven day exit or something like that, or you have to go through Ethereum. Um, and, but I, and so I, and I want it to be done at like the best possible price. Um, uh, how would this work? So I, as a market maker, would go and deposit some funds into Everclear on, let's say, Arbitrum. Um, uh, I'm kind of depositing the $1 million there, and I'm putting down my preferences for where I want the funds to end up. Um, there's flexibility here. Um, like, for example, the market maker can say things like, I want my funds to end up on either of Optimism or Polygon. I don't really care which because both are useful for me. Um, as long as just give me the better priced one, give me the one that gives me funds faster and more cheaply. Um, and, uh, and so the system, the, the, what happens after that deposit occurs is that the system periodically will batch all of that information. So the desire of this market maker and the proof that they have put funds into the system from Arbitrum to the Everclear rollup. And this, this, I guess, for lack of a better term, bridge, um, it really like we're kind of reading the state of all these chains. So lack of a better term, we're kind of bridging the data from from all from Arbitrum to to Everclear. This bridge interaction happens through Hyperlayer, um, and then it's secured by Eigenlayer um, and I, like Hyperlayer, Hyperlayer's Eigenlayer ABS. Then um, the, inter the the kind of data around this desire gets to Everclear and the Everclear rollup. Um, the Everclear rollup is, as you mentioned earlier, an Arbitrum orbit rollup. Um, uh, and the system becomes aware of what the balances look like for this specific chain and what the kind of desire of this market maker looks like. And it also knows who wants to get where and in what order they submitted their, their desires, uh, in what order they submitted you know, the interactions to Everclear. And then the system goes through a queue of everybody's, you know, like what we call in our system, we call invoices um, because they're basically like IOUs from the protocol back to back to like the market maker or to anyone else that's using it. So the system goes through this like queue of invoices and then for each invoice it will say, okay, this invoice wants to, has put in a million dollars and it wants to settle to, arbit uh, to Optimism or Polygon. Let's look at the available balances on Optimism or Polygon. Um, and it looks at the balances and finds, okay, there is a million dollars available on Optimism. I'm just going to immediately set settle the funds there. So as a, as a market maker, um, that has made this transaction, you basically sent a million dollars from Arbitrum to Optimism paying effectively zero fees, right? You've paid like a tiny amount in gas, uh, maybe a tiny amount in system fees, but that's it. Now, of course, this process could take a while, right? It might take several hours. So it's not for like end user bridging, but it's it's the backend system that can then power, you know, across, you know, the the this market maker that is rebalancing the million dollars of capital could be like across his solver that is rebalancing their liquidity because they've just made a bunch of transactions to Optimism and they wanna get, get, their, get their liquidity back there. And the more people, the more projects, the more market makers that are doing this, the more opportunities there are to find these, you know, to, for, I guess a, a good way to think about it is like coincidences of wants, right? From CowSwap. Um, the more opportunities you get to find these cows between different parties. All right, well, we're starting to get close to the top of the hour here, I know pretty elegant discussion here and I'm definitely <laughs> learning a lot. Um, I know we do want to have some opportunity to speak a little bit about, you know, how we're seeing a lot of fragmentation in the space right now. And there's the other piece to all this with uh, chain abstraction. Um, if anyone wants to hop in and speak to that, we can try to squeeze a little bit of it before we do our goodbyes uh, coming up in the next uh, 10, 15. From, from our side, like, what is chain abstraction? Chain abstraction is this, like, outcome that we kind of started talking about last year. Um, and basically, the outcome is, is it represents what, what a world should look like without fragmentation, or what Web3 should look like without fragmentation. And the idea behind this was to just have a, a North Star for everyone in the space, where we can say, we know that this is where we need to get to, and this is how we're going to refer to it. And this outcome is very, very simply, users should not need to care what chain they're on. Right. Obviously, if they want to care and if they want to understand the security implications, they could, should be able to do so, but they shouldn't have to care. Um, chain abstraction is something that's like starting to take off a lot now. There's a ton of projects that are like working towards this outcome. And this is this is something that we were super happy about because it, it just it is it is really uh, from our perspective, like the number one blocker that is stopping us from going and building the next like incredibly amazing killer app in this space. You know, there's more and more projects coming online trying to achieve this outcome. Um, and, and this includes things like intent-based bridges, like, like Across or like Uniswap X or um, like Squid or Router or tons and tons of others, right? Um, 
from our perspective, achieving this outcome requires the clearing layer. And this is this is how these two concepts tie together. It's like we we kind of got to this idea of a clearing layer because we were trying to bang our heads against how can we get to chain abstraction for every chain and every asset in a way where like we're not just ending up with a, you know 20 different intent protocols work like competing with each other on liquidity and all the liquidity just continues to be fragmented. Yeah, I think chain abstraction itself doesn't really solve fragmentation. It's more like a, for me at least, a very important thing for UX. Uh, it, it maybe solves fragmented UX, you know, that's also holding the space back maybe more than anything else even. Um, so, so yeah, uh, I think recently I'm seeing some takes out there that I don't really understand that are saying that users should still select the chain that they are, they think is most secure. I don't think that should be the case. Um, you know, um, users don't normally select whatever AWS instance, uh, that they think will serve them the stream the best or something, right? Like end users I'm talking about here. So, so yeah, I think developers should make these decisions and, um, and the cool thing uh, with chain abstraction is that developers now for the first time can make these decisions. Uh, and, and yeah, um, for the fragmentation problem, I'm not sure if I'm even still online cause yep. yeah. you okay, are. Cool. nice for the fragmentation, liquidity fragmentation problem. I mean, that's really, um, I mean, that's, that's very important for chain abstraction ultimately, because yeah, if you, if you want to use different apps on different chains and you don't want to, uh, this should be hidden from the user. So if, if you don't want to be aware on which server you're on, on which which chain you want to use Aave, for example, right? Like, or, or whatever it is. Um, um, again, uh, imagine that before you uh, stream a Netflix movie or, or before you go to your, uh, you know, your, your stock exchange or, or like Binance or whatnot, Coinbase, you then pick whatever server instance you want to be on. Like some of the, the World of Warcraft players might still remember that, like you actually pick server sometimes, but that's <laughs> normally that's for very technical users or gamers or whatnot. So, so, so yeah, that shouldn't be the case. And, but you still need, need the funds to be there. Right. So the developers still not, somehow need to make sure that your funds get there. And this is, I mean, nowadays really cleverly solved with intent based systems and, and, uh, you know, ever clear and so on. So, so ultimately you need to, liqu you need to solve liquidity fragmentation for chain abstraction to, to be possible. Uh, but yeah, chain abstraction for me is a purely sort of, um, UX more on the sort of UX API layers than it is in the, in the backend almost, although backend processes um, are definitely needed to afford chain abstraction. I think the UX can default, but ideally the user does have the option to choose the chain that they think is most secure if they care about that. For me, it's really important that we do give power back to users. And if the, the DAP itself just automatically selects everything, I don't know. I, I think I have a, ideological issue with that, but though it is probably the best thing for, for the UX. One of the key outputs of chain abstraction, right, is that there are chain abstracted, fully chain abstracted mass market applications today, like Coinbase, right? <laughs> like we, we can do this in a totally custodial way. And we've known that we can do this in a totally custodial way. The challenge is of course, getting to the point where we can do this in a way where we're like hitting the right point in the trade-off between, you know, one, one it is non-custodial and you're hitting the right point in the trade-off between like the user needs to know about every single detail versus the user is like able to verify details if they want to, but they don't need to. And I think that trade-off space is kind of where like the internet is today. Um, you know, like, do you go and verify SSL, SSL certificates of the websites that you browse to? No, because like no one has the time to do that. Can you? Yes, absolutely. You know, your browser does this to the best of its ability and it'll flag if there's an issue. And I think it's a, a kind of a similar thing where like we can work towards a UX where like wallets can protect users and flag to a user, hey, you're trying to interact with an application that's building on top of a chain that has one validator. Um, or you're trying to interact with an application that is just like saying it's a server, but it's not actually, or saying it's a rollout, but it's not, it's just a totally custodial server. Like there's, there's like ways for us to do things like that. In fact, I'm actually very interested to see if we can issue effectively some form of SSL like certificate for systems that are crypto economically secure. And like, you can, you can kind of verify that certificate and then also like show that within a wallet. Um, but I think, I think that's the kind of like that it feels like this is the place where we're in right now, where we need to, we need to figure out a way to like package up the security um, in a way where it's still like 
understandable to a user without the user having to understand what is the difference between a volition and a validium. All right, perfect. Well, we're gonna wrap things up here. So I'm gonna give everybody in this space, except uh, I guess <laughs> Tegan's gotta go. Um, but if everybody wants to talk a little about uh, their own project a little bit, uh, what's coming up for you guys, um, we can start uh, with uh, Shrigam. Yeah, thank you. Um, maybe I'll use this to point out what's going on uh, with EigenDA. Um, you know, for, for a lot of people, EigenLayer is, you know, uh, restaking and providing security to new services. One of the services we built is EigenDA, which is a highly scalable data availability system. And uh, right now, EigenDA is already on mainnet and it is running at a max throughput of 10 megabytes per second. Just to get a sense of this number, 10 megabytes per second, compared to the 4844 on Ethereum, which is, I think, 32 kilobytes per second. So we are roughly three orders of magnitude higher. So what this means is the set, set of applications that you can build have dramatically expanded. And, you know, uh, it's also true that even the 32 kilobytes per second on Ethereum is not being utilized. So suddenly now infrastructure is no longer the bottleneck or data throughput is no longer the bottleneck to building cool and interesting applications. And I think enough people have not yet noted this and starting to, you know, we're working with uh, many partners like Gelato to actually help bring a whole new family of verifiable applications on chain. So uh, yeah, so that that's my plug here. Thank you. As we um, mentioned already, um, EigenDA is, is, is live, right? And uh, actually I think one of the most exciting things that we have coming up soon is that we will enable EigenDA on our one-click deploy product that we've long wanted uh, to put more attention to. But now finally we had some time. We were very busy launching many Arbitrum chains uh, in the last month. Uh, so, so yeah, but now that the production setup is super good and the chains are live and, and chugging along, we had some time to, to finally work more on the one-click product. So. Soon, um, I think it's already the case, but like definitely next week, I think there's a big release uh, on our RAS app where you then will be able to launch one-click test nets um, as Arbitrum L2s, L3s, even Arbitrum chains on base uh, with EigenDA, SDA. So that's very exciting, and I'm I'm sure many of these chains could could use Everclear as well. So I feel like we are we are here. Uh, in uh, we have a lot of syner synergies here on this speaker panel. Yeah, it's actually, it's really cool that like, like Gelato as the platform that sort of orchestrates all of this it is sort of the, the main place where you see these, this composability get put together. And it's really cool to see that like, you can, if you go and roll a new Gelato rollup, like you can go and sort of deploy with, with things like EigenDA, with the graph, with, with Hyperlane out of the box. And then like, if you have those pieces, then you can also de deploy Everclear. And it, it, it's kind of awesome to see how those things like fit together, where it's like, I mean, it's it's almost like you know, like like npm in in a sense, right? You can just go and deploy with like these dependencies out of the box, and of course they're like much much more intensive than just simple packages. But like, um, it, I think this is this is the kind of like Lego building block stuff that we need for infrastructure to just like explode over the course of next year. Cool. I'll uh, I'll guess I'll give like a final spiel to wrap it up. So uh, to start with, I want to quickly plug both um, the graph and Hyperlane. Um, since neither, since both like John and, and Tegan had to drop off. Um, so on the graph side, I believe the uh, something that's coming up for them that's really exciting that at least I'm personally very excited about is the graph sunrise upgrade, um, which is like the migration, the full migration to the graph's decentralized network. And this is like the culmination of the work that the graph ecosystem has been doing now for like, honestly, incredibly long time. Um, it's like, basically represents like a truly open data network um, that is genuinely permissionless and genuinely decentralized, genuinely like um, able to be accessed by anybody. And like, it's extraordinarily difficult to build decentralized systems and it's even harder to build them 
at this kind of scale um, and with the kind of performance that the graph aims to deliver. So I'm personally super excited to see them hit this milestone. And and um, and if you're if you're kind of interested in the graph, um, interested in building with them, definitely go and check out their Twitter um, and their website. Um, and then on the hyperlane side, um, I. Unfortunately, don't have as much context into what they've got, they've got coming up, but I, I do want to plug that like we have just thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed working with the Hyperlane team. Um, for us, it was like a, a really straightforward decision. Hyperlane basically is just the protocol that has come up with this model of let's give truly permissionless interoperability to everybody. And um, even even beyond that, they've built just a fantastic product. Like the like we we benchmarked Hyperlane against a bunch of other things, and we just found that. It, it is really out of any of the like message transport protocols out there, um, out of all of the other protocols that are doing something similar to them. Hyperlane is just by far the best um, at the moment. And like, we're really, really excited to work with them for that reason. Um, and then lastly, on the Everclear side, um, obviously this has been a crazy and fantastic week for Everclear. Um, we're super excited to, to like kick things off in this new direction. Over the course of the coming weeks, we're going to be continuing to release more information about the project. Um, we'll be like putting out more technical explainers, helping to like break down what clearing is further, and then also talking about how this fits into the broader chain abstraction thesis, um, and helping also try to like map out the chain abstraction like ecosystem with some of the other protocols that are working there. So, um, if these are topics that you're interested in, definitely give us a follow. The new handle is Everclear Org, and yeah, keep in touch. If you're building something, definitely reach out. And yeah, with that, thank you all so much for, for coming. Thank you so much to Arbitrum for hosting.